Welcome and thanks for joining us for Two Steps Forward, our daily Bible study. I am James, this is Adrian, and uh, whether you're joining us for the first time or coming back to join us for a study, we're thankful to have you here. We are in the middle of 2 Corinthians, so we're up to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and this is episode 264 for us. Uh, anything 2 Corinthians or otherwise related before we get started here today? Um, no, I'm good. Thanks okay. for asking. You are welcome. Um, okay, so uh, what I encourage you each time to do is make sure to read through whatever your Bible at home is, if it's an NIV or an NLT or an NASB or a CEV oh, or you're giving me a headache. All, yes, all those different possible translations and people stress out a little bit sometimes about translations. Generally speaking, if it gets to the point of publishing and it's endorsed by a major kind of Christian publisher, it's a and good translation. Just go with the message. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> go, yes. It's, there, there's good ones. If you don't know, default to NIV, the New International Version. Um, but read through your copy. So read through your copy at home and familiarize yourself with your Bible. Um, and here is, I'll, each time I'll give you a little summary that is a shortened sort of paraphrase of that chapter. And here's chapter seven, which again, these chapter divisions, they're, they're man-made, not inspired by the spirit. The words, the spirit, but the divisions aren't. So the, we're catching up like this warning against idolatry spills over from chapter six into chapter seven. And Paul says at this point that since we have gospel promises from God, we should pure our, purify ourselves from anything that is unclean. Um, that's him wrapping up his prior thought. But we move into the main thought of chapter 7. Paul says all of the exhortations that he's given aren't to condemn the Corinthians because he loves them dearly. He's been pretty harsh with them. He's more harsh with them than any other congregation. Um, but he says it's, it's coming from a place of love. Paul appreciates the concern the Corinthians had for him, which was relayed to him by uh, his ministry companion, Titus, who had been with them. He says the earlier letter that he wrote, which we call 1 Corinthians, clearly had an effect on them. He's sorry they were hurt by his firm words, but thankful it led to repentance. Uh, godly sorrow on their part over sins has brought about some positive, even albeit painful changes in their lives. Titus was encouraged by the Corinthians support and it was noticeable to Paul. And so Paul says he is thankful that the Corinthians treated this messenger and his ministry companion Titus so well. Mm -hmm. Any reactions to that initially? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. So devotional thought number one then. We're going to call it correction without condemnation. Mentioned before, the Corinthian church was sort of the problem child of Paul's churches. There's other churches where Paul hardly offers any corrections. When he writes to the church in Ephesus, it's like, all right, smooth sailing. He, they're not perfect, but there aren't these like massive Isn't that issues. his favorite one? Uh, Corinthians or Ephesus? Ephesus. Which one's his favorite? He doesn't actually specify which of his ministerial children he loves the most. Oh. Uh, he loves them all in different ways. But Corinthians is the, the black sheep of the family. Mm -hmm. It's the one that's the most worldly. I mean, up until this, in, in 1 Corinthians, which remember is technically his second letter to them. Someone was sleeping with their mom. Uh, their, their father's wife. Mm -hmm. So it's a little different. It's still totally wrong. But it was, yeah, there's sexual immorality. There's cliques in the congregation. Mm -hmm. There's general worldliness. There's spiritual pride. There's mm -hmm. idolatry. Uh, tolerating all of that would not have been in their best spiritual interest. Confronting that was actually what was most loving, even though it was uh, painful. Mm -hmm. he's, he's got to explain why this is not appropriate for God's people. Throughout the process, he never suggests he's better than them. Mm -hmm. So like, that's the key. Correcting somebody without doing it in such a tone that says, I'm holier than thou. Mm -hmm. Paul doesn't do any of that kind of stuff. He, in fact, he also uses positive affirmations. He talks about how much he, uh, his love, his joy, the pride that he has in them. Uh, the entire time he was with them, he would never try to like lord anything over them. He didn't try to rule them. Uh, but there is in life, some, some people think anytime you're trying to correct, you're condemning them. Mm -hmm. They feel judged. Yeah. Just because someone feels judged doesn't necessarily mean you are judging. However, if you are correcting someone, you have to make sure that you aren't judging them. Mm -hmm. And that means you have to not say it in such a way that indicates that you are better than they are. Mm -hmm. um, there, I mean, there is correction that comes with condemnation. People do do this. So anytime you're making fun, you're gossiping, you're name calling, you're abusing, you're yelling, 
Uh, oftentimes those are correction with condemnation, but there is a correction that comes out of love, not condemnation. You have to be able to discern between those. Wait, two. what? When you're making fun of someone, that's yeah. I think you could be correcting somebody oh, in a mocking sort of tone, sure, and just making a public example of them, making fun oh, of them. Gotcha. Um, so anytime you're trying, point is, human beings do need some correction mm -hmm. when you correct them. So like you can either. Two options, or sometimes people judge from a distance, mm -hmm. or they correct them closely, but like way too harshly. Yeah. Um, the, you have to be close, you have to be relational, you do have to correct when they're wrong and especially impenitent, mm -hmm. but you have to do it without any tone of, I'm better than you. Yeah. And sometimes it helps just to start by upfront saying, look, I am not better than you. And even maybe even mentioning a specific sin that you have that's in the same realm, mm -hmm. you know? And nonetheless, same, but it can I, be tough if you don't have a specific sin within that realm. So, like, I am never late. <laughs> I just get where I'm supposed to get on time. Well, okay. I see it as part of being an adult. The, so, when people are late, if I had to talk to someone about being late or recurring late, it would be really difficult for me to do that without judgment. Mm -hmm. Do you, that's just an example. Do you ever inconvenience anyone and cost them time? No. Okay, so this is this would be an example of correction with condemnation. <laughs> uh, so the thing is, anytime you're saying like, well, I can't think of an example because I'm never blank. Boom, guaranteed. You're go whenever you correct somebody, then you're going mm -hmm. to be judgmental because this is the whole premise. Right, of that's what I'm saying. It can be difficult. No, in certain areas. I'm saying you shouldn't be judgmental. You need to humble yourself and realize mm -hmm. that you're guilty of that in some way too. So Jesus' Sermon on uh, the Mount. Yeah. You're, well, you're like one of the, uh, like a Pharisee standing there. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is saying, yeah, you think you haven't committed adultery, but have you committed lust in your heart? Yeah. You think mm -hmm. you haven't stolen from anybody, but have you ever been a little greedy? You think you've never murdered anybody? Uh -huh. Have you ever hated anybody? And you should be saying, yeah, you got me. Uh -huh. I'm just not late. Okay. The, the point is, have you ever inconvenienced yes, someone I with time? <clears throat> I understand the point. Then you have no right to be judgmental. Right. I'm not saying that I have the right. I'm saying it can be difficult in areas ah, where that's true. It can. It absolutely can be difficult. No, I. Yeah, you're right. It. There are certain things where, yes, that might be one area where you're really actually mm -hmm. pretty good at, and somebody else isn't. To not show compassion in areas where, or to show compassion in areas where you yourself have been able to. It's yeah. It's it's very difficult. Um, you know, I think. There's a mentality that says if people, and this is partially American mentality, where we think we're the land of opportunity, and if people would just pull themselves up by their bootstraps, mm -hmm. and um, you know, like they they should be able to figure their lives out, and they don't realize we haven't walked quite the same path, mm -hmm. and we don't have quite the same gifts, which every Christian should be able to acknowledge. That's just a basic Bible teaching. We don't all have the same gifts, mm -hmm. so there should be a level of compassion attached to people's yeah. weaknesses. But, yes. That's a good point. And I almost just said we do all have clocks though, but that does not factor in. So like, it's easy for me to get placed on time because A, I don't have children. Yeah. B, I have a husband. Yeah. So not everyone who does things, some things around the house that I don't have to do. Yeah. So it's, that's a good point. It's, I should be thinking of, um, so all the circumstances God has blessed me with that enable me to be on time. Everyone doesn't yeah. have those. There are blessings that other people might not have. Oh, I just corrected myself. <laughs> with love. <laughs> the, uh, so if you're on our YouTube series here, or if you're on YouTube watching this series and not listening to the podcast or whatever, well, actually we have it on a podcast. Too, we're doing an, a series at St. Marcus called Scripture Over Social Media. And the basic premise of it is we want our base, our, our worldview to be influenced primarily by the Bible, not by the thoughts in the media that goes on around us. Mm -hmm. But the next series that we're doing is on temptations common to men and women. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very easy. I think where sexism tends to come in is where we don't appreciate that, okay, men and women are wired a little bit differently and therefore Satan might mm -hmm. uniquely kind of uh, tempt males or females in slightly different ways and it's very easy to be judgmental of mm -hmm. the other of the other sex for things that you might not struggle with to the same degree and i think that's maybe kind of a similar issue mm -hmm. here is it right to correct them yes so you should be but if you're doing it sympathetically you're not condemning them but you if you really love them you are correcting them mm -hmm. 
Uh, devotional thought number two, encouraged by a friend. Uh, remember Titus, this, so this is the Titus that the Apostle Paul writes his New Testament letter to. Uh, he becomes one of his close ministry companions that serves as his proxy a lot of times when Paul can't be everywhere and he has to send, you know, Timothy or Titus or a messenger like that. Uh, Titus had visited Paul when he was in Macedonia. He gave a positive report about how the Corinthians were doing. Paul was pleased to get the positive report. He was also pleased that the Corinthian church, who hadn't always treated everybody particularly well, and they were upset that Paul wasn't visiting them. They were upset that he's sending somebody else. But nonetheless, Titus says they treated him really well. And we're told, Paul says here, he finds happiness in the happiness of his friends. Um, interestingly, you know, in Paul's writings in the New Testament, there are numerous occasions. Rome, here, Ephesus, the Ephesian elders. We're told on numerous occasions that Paul says he's just overjoyed happy because some of his Christian friends visit him. Mm -hmm. Which I think is really interesting. Is the guy's gone through a ton of stuff, but just to get like the presence of Christian friends visiting him mm -hmm. is such an encouragement to him. I just uh, was reading an article in uh, Psychology Today that said one in two Gen Z members, uh, Generation Z, 54% uh, of them actually, and 51% of millennials reported that they routinely feel lonely. Mm -hmm. um, and you say, well, everybody feels kind of lonely sometimes, whatever. This is significantly higher than prior generations report. Um, and, you know, it's it's also interesting that we are coming out perhaps now of a two-year period of a sort of intense isolation through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the fact that the internet has allowed us to maintain distance in ways that you previously weren't able to do. Um, it, it's just a good reminder to have close personal friends that you're meeting with in your life. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul, if you say, what are the happiest moments in his ministry? It very clearly seems to be when his Christian friends visit him mm -hmm. or when he hears good reports, he celebrates the, the, the good news of his Christian friends. Uh, how important to your overall health, because mm -hmm. every once in a while we'll have a conversation about this. Like, do we have, do you and I have enough friends? Do we, you know, like that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Uh, how important are Christian friends to your personal wellness? Uh, important. I, I find friendship difficult because uh, it requires, like anything else, I find reading books difficult because it requires a certain amount of work. There's energy attached to it. Yeah. Know. So after my work week, I'm. it's just been so busy lately. You're like, go from one thing to the next to the next, like one case to the next. And it has been increasingly like the last three or four weeks more so. And I'm just so exhausted at the end of the week that in my head, I think like, I don't want to make plans on the weekend. Like I just want to recharge. But I think... I think if I were to spend time with people that would be recharging in a, a, a different beneficial way. Um, yeah, but I, I think I said like, was like last week or something, I wish I was better friends with so-and-so. I think I named like two people and you were like, all you'd have to do is call them. Like I guaranteed like they want to spend time with you. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, the call is the difficult part. And I don't know, I was even talking to one of my friends yesterday after church and I thought in my head, I should just call her on the phone, mm -hmm. you know, or like our friend who moved to North Carolina, mm -hmm. we have FaceTimed twice and I'm like, it's so easy and so enjoyable. Like, why aren't I doing it? But the thought of doing it seems like work to me and I'm like, yeah. oh, it's a lot of work. Yeah. I think both, of, makes sense. both of us are... Probably. I'm, I'm more so an introvert. I don't which, think I'm an introvert. So like I like being around people. Yeah. I, you know, there's also the element of, uh, you know, as American consumer culture, we tend to think of everything of, will this benefit me? Mm -hmm. And friendship yeah. is inherently, I mean, do you benefit from it? Yes. But it also costs you stuff. Mm -hmm. And the idea like, okay, do I want to call and spend the next 45, 60 minutes potentially just listening to somebody else and their problems? Mm -hmm. Like that might not be inherently like pleasurable, but it's very hard for Americans to get themselves out of that mindset mm -hmm. that I'm going to just go do something that <laughs> I don't get pleasure 
pressure out of. Yeah. You know, so to think of like being able to think of relationships differently, mm -hmm. like long term, I will benefit from this, but long term, somebody else will benefit from this. And therefore, I'm just committed to the process, mm -hmm. I'm not committed to like, okay, well, I have a good time with this person this weekend. Mm -hmm. Like, no, I need to do the, the necessary things to facilitate a healthy relationship. I also think for people our age, the phone is like a lost art of communication. It's the last thing I want to do on, on my phone thing. is actually call. Yes. Humans. And yeah. I have friends that I text quite often and I'm like, I would really like to talk to them about this, but I'm not going to see them for like three weeks, mm -hmm. you know? And yes. I'm like, you, you could just pick up the <clears throat> phone and call them. Does FaceTime help? Um, I think FaceTime does help. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think so too. Um, the thing is, if you want the relationship, so we, we dated long distance. We talked on the phone literally th like two to three hours a day, mm -hmm. which is why I failed many classes. Um, no, I only failed one. It was accounting. So I wasn't really that good at it anyway. Um, but you know, like that was not, that was like enjoyable. I looked forward to it in no way did I see that as work. Mm -hmm. um, why are you laughing? You didn't enjoy it? No. Well, there were there were certainly times where I wish it wasn't like it was hard. But the I, yeah, you wish you didn't have to do it that way. But no, I, I was thankful for uh, the ability to call after nine o'clock and not use my anytime minutes. And you know, like we had all these weird like parameters that we had to work around. Yeah, one time I texted you too much, and your dad was like, "It's a quarter of text," so we kind of got in trouble. <laughs> Well, it adds up. You know? <laughs> um, the but I was actually just telling somebody at this at a wedding uh, yesterday how we did, dated long distance uh -huh. three years and saw each other for like thirty seven days or something like that uh -huh. before we got married and how tough that was. It's doable when you recognize it's a good thing and when you recognize th there will be an end date to it. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, so that's why, you know, a uh, situation with like a friend who has moved away, I think makes it even tougher yeah. because you don't know exactly what, mm -hmm. you know, how that relationship is going to change. Yeah. And I've had a lot of guilt over, so we've lived now in three places. Yeah. Um, and especially the last place we were at, we had really close friends, really good friends. And some of them, when we first moved here, came out to visit us and, and that was great. I don't think we were like super inviting. So like sure. they both of them were like we're gonna come visit you. Yeah. We're never like come visit us. Yeah. Um. So I think, but I have a lot of guilt over not maintaining or not even attempting to maintain some of those relationships. Yeah. And uh, you know, maybe it's okay that you go through different periods of your life where uh, you have different friends. I mean, yeah. During that period, we were all in a similar. Um, age group and lifestyle group. So when we left there, I would have been 31. So like at that point, all of them were having kids and then like all their kids were in school together. So that mm -hmm. was kind of like a different dynamic. Um, so not that I don't care about those people or wouldn't enjoy seeing those people, but I'm like, maybe that friendship served for that, for that particular, season, yeah. yeah, like season in life and now things are just a little bit different and you make other friends. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as we're talking it through, the, the thing I would think would be the application here from Paul is to understand even even when you don't get something instantaneously out of it, the part of the reason that we exist on Earth is to facilitate friendships. And so, Paul, if if the greatest missionary in world history couldn't do it without good Christian friends, don't assume that you can have any kind of productive, God pleasing life without. Mm -hmm. Uh, having good Christian friends without being a good Christian friend of people like commit yourself to being a better friend whatever that looks like wherever you currently are commit yourself to being like going traveling doing the distance going the distance uh, to be a good friend Christian friend of people um, weirdly I don't have any oh yeah I do on my resolution list you're making fun of it says make plans with a friend at least once a week so I don't do those power okay. sheets anymore but I've talked about them they're just goal setting goals for every day, week, month, because I, and the reason I don't do them is because I get really exhausted by this constant, like pursuing of goals. Yeah. Um, especially when I was in school, like that was my goal, just finish school. But one thing that was really good about them is there was always a relationship. You had to make certain relationship yeah. goals. So I was very intentional about reaching out to certain people or contacting certain people a certain number of times. And I do think that that's help. That is helpful. Right. Yeah. The, the, 
uh, like guilt that you maybe should feel like accountability over facil- uh, maintaining relationships and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Like some of us need a little extra um, help and boundaries and accountability to do that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And so it is helpful for that. But like I said, whatever it looks like for you to uh, be a whatever, whoever it is, Titus to Paul, you know, and Titus will not go down in history as the most you know, whatever in the Christian church, but he was really, really, really important to the greatest missionary in the history of the Mm -hmm. the church. And so like, okay, in humility, what does it mean to be a Titus to somebody right now? Maybe. Yeah. So so you have to travel, you have to serve as a proxy and do some of their work for them. And it brings them great joy in their life. And just pray God will have somebody do that in your life too. All right. Devotional thought number three, painful, but healthy. Uh, Again, Paul says, You notice in the way he writes, he says he doesn't regret writing 1 Corinthians to them, which he knows caused them a great deal of pain. Because, I mean, you read through 1 Corinthians and it's tons and tons of corrections. It was hard for him to do it. He doesn't want to see them sad, but he does want to see them saved. And I think that's the, like, the most interesting balance in correcting somebody. He doesn't want to see them sad. It's not that he wants to see them sad. Mm -hmm. It hurts him to see them sad, but he really wants to see them saved. And that's why he's willing to have these conversations. It's necessary for him. Um, having, I know this as a pastor, I think this is probably the hardest but most important, argued with the most important part of my job is having real spiritual sin confronting conversations. Uh, it's difficult. I've also come to the conclusion most Christians don't do them. Mm-hmm. Most Christians won't do them. Parents won't do them with their kids. Uh, at least when it becomes like a certain age. Mm-hmm. Um, and at that point, maybe it is more the church's job than the parent's job to have some of those conversations. Mm-hmm. But it's it's very interesting to me how difficult it is for parents to have those kinds of conversations with kids. Um, so you either it's easy to judge somebody from a distance, as I mentioned, or it's easy to chicken out when you get in close proximity with somebody. But, um, you know, we all struggle with our own sins. Um we all struggle to address, I mean, us too. We struggle to address, we struggle with our own sins, mm-hmm. but we also struggle to address the sins in the lives of, okay, so a um, friends who are a non Christian couple from our perspective mm-hmm. living together, um, Christian friends who are housing a couple who are living together, mm-hmm. um, Christian friends who are completely unbiblical on issues of human sexuality. Mm-hmm. Um, Christian friends who are, it it spans too, overly political, uh, financially stingy, Mm -hmm. um, gossipy. Like we, we struggle to address that. I'm saying not humans, just in general, we personally struggle Mm -hmm. to address that and have had conversations like, Oh, I should have said something. Yes. Like we'll walk away from it spending time with somebody it's like why did i not think at some point to bring this up and it's because it's like uncomfortable and we don't want to be holier than thou and we don't want to be judgmental and yeah uh what so what advice would you give like either to us or to people in general about having uh spiritual critical conversations you have to anticipate that it's not gonna go well so i mean a perfect case scenario the person like acknowledges and repents and thanks you. Yeah. Um, but the, so like I've had, had a conversation with my friend who calls herself Christian and I said to her and is living with her boyfriend. I said to her once, um, I don't, I'm not saying you're not a Christian, but like, I don't see any fruit of Christianity in your life. Yeah. So this was like a 40 minute conversation over a walk. And there was a lot of silence in that walk. Oh, a yeah. lot of awkward silence. And there were times where she definitely kicked back against some of the things I was saying mm-hmm. and made some points where I'm like, okay, yep, I overlooked that and I acknowledge that you do do this. Yeah. Um, but let me explain to you how like that's not enough or... That's one of know. the reasons it's hard too is the moment you start to correct somebody else yeah human nature is to get defensive and they might start pointing out some of your flaws too Mm -hmm. or some of the ways that you've been or that you're just wrong and we don't like to get called out ourselves so we if i don't call anybody else out they don't they don't have the opportunity to call me out Mm -hmm. you know yep yeah it's it's super tough Uh, i'm not saying any of us are good at this uh inherently i've had to again literally like psych myself up in a car you before just, talking to somebody yeah, sometimes. Yeah, you just have to be okay with the outcome. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Yeah, and the thing about taking people's words and actions in the kindest way possible, um, I have a friend lately that I've said some pretty honest things to, and she took them very well and actually said, I'm proud of you for taking that so well. And she said, you know, throughout the last however long, God's been humbling me. And, you know, like when you get to a point where you where someone has to say those things to you, I mean, that's at a point where you're yeah. pretty low and God has kind of humbled you a little bit. But um, she actually said to me, I was telling her, kind of, and I said it jokingly, that I avoid a certain person because of their social tendencies. And she said, Adrian, that's terrible. I don't think she used my full name. She wasn't like yelling at me. <laughs> and she said, Aid, right. that is terrible. <laughs> and she said, that person can't help that they're like that. And I said, yeah, that's what annoys me though, is that they can. And she said, then you need to teach them. Mm, she got you. She, she really got me. And honestly, when she said it, I was thinking to myself, like, wow, it's been a long time since anyone has corrected me and really corrected me like that on anything. I've, you've broken my spirit. <laughs> I've tried. And I was going to tell her I appreciated it, and then I didn't, because so I was like, well, I don't want too much more of it. Yeah. Um, no, I did appreciate it though, and she and then she said like I'm not condemning you. I am just challenging you a little bit on this. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was it was really good, and I'm thankful that she did say something. Um, yeah, I and I think we like to surround. So my best friend, where we used to be, her husband would always say when I would say something that he didn't agree with. He'd be like, where's your friend who always agrees with you? Yeah. She, she, we just like, she just always. It was like part of the definition of friendship was to have that person's back and ag in agreeing with them yeah. on stuff that you didn't even have an opinion about that. <laughs> yeah. Where's my friend? Who, sometimes I say that. I'm like, where's my friend who always agrees with me? Yeah. Because it feels good to have someone. But it yeah. also doesn't, maybe doesn't feel good, but it's necessary to have someone who will say those things to you i think that's i mean but i think that's just a very simple but really good uh like mental shift in what a friend is a friend is not somebody who just implicitly mm -hmm. agrees with you on everything but sometimes uh, a friend is somebody there's a friend there a person who always loves you mm -hmm. but sometimes that love is not going to be to agree with you it's actually going to be to like gently correct you mm -hmm. oh, i think that's the uniqueness maybe of a christian friend good conversation about friendship yeah there you go should we close the prayer sure. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time in your word today. Uh, as as uh, Paul was delighted by having his friend Titus visit him and bringing a good report and his happiness and the Corinthians' happiness was actually what made Paul happy. Help us to appreciate the importance of Christian friends. Help us to be good Christian friends to somebody who needs it right now. Uh, all the research says that a lot of people, including a lot of young people, are feel really lonely, don't feel like they have anybody in their life that they can truly be genuinely transparent with and confess their struggles to. Um, if, if we can be that person to them, that's maybe what love looks like in our life right now. So help us to do that and help us to have good Christian friends too. May it glorify you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for studying with us today. We'll see you next time for 2 Corinthians chapter 8.